we once again have to jump to the next immediately to Mike. I already have seen you. And Mike, the screen is yours. Thank you, Dr. Grabner. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes, it's fine. Yeah, welcome to my presentation. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of the World Wood Day Symposium for the invitation to participate. Uh, I'm very happy to once again be part of the World Wood Day event and uh, thank to all the staff at IWCS as well as the World Wood Day Foundation. It's nice to see some of you. I really hope that we soon will be able to meet again in person. The title of my presentation is 100 years of artisanal alphorn making, an appreciation of the first professional alphorn maker in Switzerland. That's exactly 100 years ago that he started working as a first as a part time, then as a full time alphorn maker. I would like to thank the authors of this book, Reinhold Reber and Fritz Rötlisberger for sharing with me the findings of their research on the subject. The book was published in 2019 and many photos in my presentation are taken from this book with kind permission by the publishers. So I would first talk about the situation up to the year 1921. Playing the Alphorn used to be a pastime of Alpine cowherds who were guarding their flocks on higher mountain pastures in the summertime. This could at times be a rather lonesome occupation and they manufactured their music instruments um, to pass the time. And they put them to use to attract, to call the cattle back from the pastures to the, to the stable. Most of them made their instruments by themselves, taking, for instance, any young tree that they saw fitted. Because of the difference of the raw material and the individual technique, every alphorn was rather primitive and unique in length, intonation and sound. I'm going to show a few pictures where you can see that the length of the instruments is not standardized in any way. Rarely were two instruments compatible and the Alphorn was almost exclusively used as a solo instrument to be played alone. After the turn of the century leading up to the First World War, Switzerland was surrounded by powerful neighbor countries, empires and kingdoms, and felt the need to establish some sort of national identity. They turned to the Alpine, Alpine folklore as part of their identity. The Swiss Yodeling Association was formed in 1910 and the Alphorn was rediscovered by a new generation. Formerly, the Alphorn was the symbol and soundtrack of nature-loving intellectuals and early tourists during the enlightened era of the early 1800s, but it had almost completely disappeared by 1900. In 1921, Oskar Friedrich Schmaltz, who was a composer of yodeling songs and a patron of the folklore movement, aimed to revive the use of the Alphorn. 
He founded the Emmental Alphorn Society. Soon after, his friend Johann Rudolf Krenger likewise started the Berner Oberland Alphorn Society. To improve the level of playing, Schmaltz planned to organize musical courses for Alphorn players. Now, all that they needed were some quality instruments. Here I come to the biography of Adolf Oberly. Adolf Oberly was born on June 8, 1879 in the rural Emmental region. After his school years, he apprenticed at the Cooper shop nearby. After completing his apprenticeship, he went to work as a Cooper for several wineries in the Lake Neuchâtel area in the French speaking part of Switzerland. Around 1908, he settled in Zwischenflü in the Dimtigen Valley. This is in the Simmental area, famous for their cattle breeding. It is located in the uh, region leading up to the Alps. We call this the pre-Alpine region. Oberle settled in Zwischenflü because it was the birthplace of his wife and he opened up his own coopery. Here he specialized in making wooden utensils for use in milk processing and cheese making. His first Alphorn he made out of curiosity, as he was quoted in 1915. He may have been inspired by the availability of a suitable kind of wood, the alpine spruce, growing in the pre-alpine area at a thousand meters or more above sea level. The raw climate and short vegetation period make for a slow growth and the high density of the wood which results in a superb tonal quality that is also appreciated by makers of violins or guitars. Here we see Oberle in a picture from around 1920, a proud craftsman. Adolf Oberle was first contacted by Oskar Schmaltz in order to repair and restore a number of broken alphorns that Schmaltz had collected. After the founding of the Emmental Alphorn Society, Schmaltz acquired support from a wealthy donor and he ordered 12 alphorns to be made by Oberle which he wanted to hand out at the first Emmental Alphorn workshop in October. Soon after, another 12 instruments were ordered by the Berner Oberland Alphorn Society. This was quite a huge order. And from this moment on, Oberle called himself Alphorn Maker. By the mid thirties, Wooden items for dairy use were replaced by brass vessels due to government hygiene regulations and Oberle turned gradually into a full-time Alphorn maker. The demand for quality instruments was booming in pre-Second World War Switzerland. At the 1939 National Swiss Exposition, the famous Landi. At least one Alphorn by Oberle was on prominent display. It was included into the famous mural celebrating Swiss folk arts. Subsequently, 
the reputation of Adolf Oberle grew and his instruments were delivered all over Switzerland and put to use. In 1944, the house and his workshop in Zwischenflü was destroyed when after an enormous thunderstorm, the place was flooded up to the first floor ceiling with water, mud and debris. Oberly lost all his tools and his wood stock. Eventually he and his wife went to live with their daughter at the village of Beauville in the Emmental. Here in this building, he set up a workshop. As there was no electricity available, Oberly made his alphorns using only hand tools by the light of a petroleum lamp. The death of his wife in 1953 was a fateful event for the 74 year old. Oberly decided once more that it was time to move. He left Boville in November 1953 to go to live in Gstaad in the Berner Oberland with his nephew Ernst Oberly, who was a cabinet maker and later uh, also made some alphorns. Here he converted an old bee house into both his living and working space. His bed, for instance, was made in a cupboard with, with doors which he could close during the day when he was at work. The following 15 years proved to be a most prolific period. And Oberly manufactured a large number of Alphorns up to 1969. In 1972, Adolf Oberly passed away at the age of 93. This is my humble attempt at a historical assessment and appreciation of Adolf Oberly. Adolf Oberly was self-taught as an Alphorn maker. He did not have any blueprint or template, but started out of curiosity, helped by his high level of craftsmanship, ability of doing precision work, a natural affinity for wood and the musical ear. From 1921 on, Oberly gained a reputation for quality instruments of precise length and accurate intonation. As this is a prerequisite for playing together in harmony, Oberly contributed to, if not enabled, the evolution of the typical uh, multi-voiced Alphorn style of the past 100 years. Oberly never stopped searching for ways to improve the instruments, experimenting in different ways of manufacturing, designing special tools, and applying trial and error methods to find the perfect scaling and making subtle changes in the dimensions and shape of the horns. He also refined and developed the mouthpieces This is a mouthpiece by Adolf Oberle made out of boxwood. The precise work of Oberle made the embouchure and intonation of the instruments more reliable and precise. It helped that Oberle also was an active Alphorn player. Being in close contact with other Alphorn players gave him impulses and he could profit from their experience and their feedback. Here in this picture, we have Oberle on the right, together with his two nephews, Fritz and Ernst. Oberle 
shared, always shared his knowledge with interested young craftsmen. Some even joined him in his workshop and were allowed to use his templates and measures for their own production. A number of Alphorn players can be traced back to the Oberly line. Only for about the last 25 years, a new generation of Alphorn makers are making use of digital automation and CNC machines, making the Alphorn production much more serial and extremely precise. Some people though still prefer the handmade, one of a kind Alphorn made by a master craftsman with a sure instinct for the living material, wood. Many Alphorns manufactured by Adolf Oberly are still in use and are cherished by their owners. I had the opportunity to play on an Oberly Alphorn for several times and I was impressed by their easy access, accuracy, playability, and majestic sound. In this picture, this horn is about 75 years old. The reputation that Oberly enjoys up to today in the Alphorn field is ongoing and may be equal to the prestige of a Stradivari among violin enthusiasts. So Adolf Oberly is a pioneer and a big influence on the Swiss Alphorn scene up to the present. With that, I have reached the end of my presentation and I thank you for your kind attention. Mike, many thanks. Are there some questions from the audience? I don't see something written at the moment. I think I have said it all. Yeah, maybe. Yes, yes, you're right. You, you had a perfect talk, so <laughs> there are no, no open questions. Okay, yeah, then thank you very much for your very interesting talk on the, on the iPod. Many thanks. You're welcome. Bye-bye.